Before I leave, I grabbed my phone and Facebooked the fact that I was sitting in my car sobbing because I am incapable of experiencing a moment or an emotion without desperately trying to share it with an audience. Thanks for coming tonight. I finally did wipe my tears. I walked down Elizabeth. I got to Woodward. Woodward is the spine of Detroit. It goes from the river to way out to Pontiac. It divides Detroit into east side and west side, which is how Detroit is divided. With all due respect to Journey, there are no city boys born and raised in South Detroit, because there is no South Detroit. <laughs> South Detroit is Canada. Uh, Windsor comes around the bottom. So I wipe my face standing at that corner on Woodward. I can see Comerica Park where the Tigers play. Just beyond that, Ford Field where the Lions play. And I'm standing next to the Fillmore Theater. A couple of houses down from the Fillmore Theater is the Fox Theater. The Fox Theater built in the late 20s is one of the original movie palaces. It was the first movie house built with sound for the talkie pictures that were just getting popular. They remodeled this thing six months after I graduated high school into this gorgeous 5,000 seat live venue. It is amazing. It has been my wet dream of a venue for as long as I've been on stages. I've driven past that thing a hundred times and every time I look up at it and think, maybe someday I'll sell out the Fox Theater. And I'll be honest with you, that dream has kind of faded a little bit over the last few years. I mean, I've been on the road 14 years, and I've never sold out a 100-seat theater, so 5,000 at the Fox is starting to feel a little silly. I've also never performed in Detroit. I've been 14 years on the road everywhere else. I've never had a hometown show. But that day, standing at the Fox, I'm looking out, and I'm thinking, maybe, because I am now seeing a friend of mine, John Grady, who's a storyteller like I am, who's part of the Moth Main Stage National Tour. So they have just five people on stage telling stories in front of all these people at the Fillmore. I'm looking at the Fox thinking, you know, I've got a show now for the first time. I am six days away from my hometown debut. For his violent torpedo of truth tour, Charlie Sheen sold out the Fox Theater in 15 minutes. Fuck Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Charlie Sheen was booed off the stage of the Fox Theater, so fuck Charlie Sheen. <laughs> So I'm standing there looking at this, thinking about that I am accidentally having my hometown debut because I've accidentally been hanging around this park around the corner from these theaters. Grand Circus Park in Detroit. It also is on each side of Woodward. I've been hanging out there and occupied Detroit and I never saw that happening. I never saw that coming. I travel most of the time. I, I've kind of, I do one man storytelling shows. I do college talks and I do middle school don't be a bully assemblies. And if you add up those three things, it's almost a full-time job. The rest of the time, I'm a stay-at-home dad. But I had a college talk at SUNY Rockland, like 40 minutes out of the city. I had a college talk there, and I had heard about Occupy Wall Street. But there had been a, something of a media blackout for those first few days, those first few weeks of the movement. But I caught wind of it through some progressive friends, and I wanted to come down to Occupy Wall Street not for any great um, revolutionary zeal, but for shameless self-promotion. So my main touring show is called Preacher Man, and I do that as a narrator, the Reverend Nuge. So I have these little Reverend Nuge loves you buttons that I hand out to market my show. So I was in London, Ontario a few years ago, and I'm handing out these buttons. I had some in my pocket. This homeless guy asks for some change. I reach in my pocket, I scoop out a bunch, and I drop it in his hand, and I did accidentally drop the Reverend Nuge button on top. And he looks down and he goes, what the hell's a Reverend Nuge? I don't know where this came from. But I just looked him dead in the eye real earnest and went, I cannot speak of it until the time is right. <laughs> but he's a good guy and he loves you. <laughs> and the look of half terror and half wonderment on his face was beautiful. So I've decided I'm going to do that all over the world. I hand out, even if I don't have a show, I hand out these buttons. So I also filmed these little Rev on the Road travel documentaries up on YouTube. And so I'm down at Zuccotti and I'm filming some stuff and I'm handing out my River News Loves You buttons. And, and I'm an old Burning Man guy from way back, so I saw the tents and I felt the, the drum circles. It felt familiar to me. I'm like, all right, I can dig this. Geraldo Rivera comes down and turns on the cameras for Fox News and as soon as they line up, he gets swarmed. Everyone's around him going, fuck Fox News, fuck Fox News. And he couldn't get his segment on the air. And he goes walking away all pissed off looking. I go, hey, Geraldo. Reverend Nudes loves you, man, and I gave him a button. That's all I cared about. A couple weeks later, Occupy Detroit is jumping off. I hear it in the news, and I'm like, I'm going to step up my shameless self-promotion to the next level. So protest signs, that made sense. So playing off the theme, my sign was, 
Reverend Nuge loves you 99%. That's all right. But then my other one on the other side is my favorite. It says, Reverend Nuge, 99% love, 1% asshole, percentages may vary. Pretty good, right? <laughs> I showed it to my eight-year-old daughter who went, mm, more like 15%. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you for that. So I took my sign down there. The extent of my activism was to try and photobomb the word asshole on the evening news. I'm jumping behind cameras with this. But then they had everyone get down, and there was a thousand people that night. They had everyone kind of, everyone, but they had people who wanted to come forward and kind of say why they were there to start off the first General Assembly. The first woman that gets up, number one, is wearing a rubber nudes button, which was excellent. But she says, it is my 60th birthday. I've been waiting 30 years for this. And her eyes missed up. The next person that gets up is this young kind of college age, this young guy who speaks with such eloquence and understanding of the, the political issues and the social economic issues. And I'm like, wow, we have a middle-aged union guy get up who's been fighting for labor for the past decades. And this excitement being in the midst of all these people, and I've been waiting 30 years for this, and we're going to change this, and I started to get excited. For a long time, I thought, I live, we live in a corrupt political system, but I thought, it's so big and monstrous, monstrous that there's no way we're going to fix it. And I've also thought, so long as I can carve out my own little corner of the universe within that big system, that's the best I can do. Number one, it's not a real interconnected, enlightened way to live. But number two, my corner of the universe, like a lot of ours, since the economic crash, has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And what pissed me off is when I found out of the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill, how it was gutted because Wall Street sent 2,000 lobbyists to D.C. to work on the bill. And the 2,000? I mean, that's four or five lobbyists for every single member of the House and the Senate. You know, I, don't, I can't make a phone call and send people to affect legislation. We bought our house from my dad and his brother when my grandma passed away. It was her home, and we bought it from my dad and her bro his brother when they inherited it, <laughs> and we paid full price, which still kind of pisses me off. But So I bought our modest 1,200-square-foot home. We paid on it for nine years. We owe 100000 left on our mortgage. After the economic crash, we found out that our house is now worth about $50,000. Part of the deal with the bank bailouts is that they're supposed to help people like me. Instead, they acquire more banks, and they pay out bonuses. And, I have called the Bank of America to try and get a refi that we've been promised. They say, fill out this gigantic stack of paperwork. We send it in. They say, wait so many days. We wait. We call over and over again. We cannot speak to a live human being on the phone. We call them. Finally, someone tells us, we've never received your application. But if you fax this next application, I'm sure we'll take a look at that. So it's this god-awful stack. We fill it out, fax it. We wait, we wait. We call, we call. We can't speak to anyone. Finally, we speak to someone who says, no, we've never received your application. In the meantime, my wife, who works in an industry like a lot of us that has no protection for workers, where you can be fired for any or no reason, is fired for a bullshit reason. Now we really need this modification. We fill out another set of paperwork, and amazingly, they get a hold of us to tell us that because I'm self-employed and my wife is now unemployed, we don't qualify for the remodification. So we try and appeal and call and call. We cannot speak to a human being on the phone. My wife's unemployment insurance runs out. We have a three-week period of time where we cannot pay our mortgage. This same company that we couldn't speak to anyone, they unleash their collection department on us, and we get a phone call two or three times every single day from Bank of America asking where's their money, saying, we'll put it on your credit card. We'll take a check by phone. I'm like, you'll get your money when we have it. But what can I do? That's the system. They wrote the laws, so nothing they do is technically illegal. But now I'm sitting in a park with a thousand people going, we're going to push back against this system. And I started to think, maybe, maybe. I go to the next General Assembly. I go to the next General Assembly. And I lay awake one night thinking, all right, if I had a magic wand where one thing could come out of Occupy that I wanted, what would it be? It doesn't matter how impossible, but just one narrow thing. Because there's that whole, we don't have goals thing. So I'm trying to think where I would point towards. So I'm thinking it would be the public financing of all federal elections. All right, you run for the House, the Senate, or the presidency. Nobody can write you a check, which means nobody can call you later and say, hey, remember that check? So yeah, at this point, with Citizens United, it's a, it would take a constitutional amendment, and we'd have to fight this unbelievable system. But that's I'm going to be a, a single-issue occupier, and I'm going to always lean towards public financing. Beyond that, in the meantime, well, what do I do for the movement day to day? I had a Zen teacher a while back who recommended an experiment. She said, take a 24-hour period of time, 
and do what she called the butler's mantra. That you just quietly, in your mind, ask yourself, whenever you're interacting with a human being, how may I serve you, like a butler? And then you act out that action. It could be a smile, it could be holding a door for someone, it might be offering somebody the change in your pocket. But you spend just 24 hours, and I've done that a few times, and those days have felt amazing, so I try and work it into my life. And I thought that's what I'll do with Occupy. However I can be of service in this park to these people, that's what I'm gonna do. And I would watch the working group report backs, maybe facilitation or direct action or camp security. And I would think, you know, if they're calling for help, can I help them? I was cleaning bathrooms at this nightclub across the street that was closed but donated their bathrooms for our use. And we encamped in Grand Circus Park, which is a park that a lot of times has a lot of homeless people living there. And when we set up a camp and kitchen and food and clothing donations, and we had no rules to go with our food and clothing and donations, like a lot of the, the shelters do, we had a ton of people come to hang out in the park. So it's this crazy mix of occupiers and homeless. And, and after a few weeks of everybody living in the park, you can't really tell on site who's an occupier and who's a homeless. So that was awesome. <laughs> And then the media team was calling for help. And I thought, you know what, I shoot and edit video and I can write, let me do that. So I go down to the first media meeting that I was uh, knew about, and it was at this little coffee shop called 1515 Broadway. And I go down there and there's this guy out holding the door open for people, kind of an older guy, a little bit shriveled up, smoking a cigarette, a few wisps of hair combed back, a few teeth left in his mind. I'm not trying to be unkind, but just to describe, he's like five teeth left. And, and he's, I find out he owns the coffee shop. And the media meetings move, but I talk to him a little bit and find out that he has been an activist from way back. He was one of the two founding members of the Detroit chapter of Vietnam veterans against the war way back in the day. And he has this old no war sign that's faded that was at least as old as the first Gulf War. And he tells me, he's like, yeah, you know, we're all in favor of what you guys are doing with Occupy, but some of us have been doing this a while. Don't think you started this shit. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So I go to the media meeting and now I've jumped in and the camera is helpful to me because I have a chronic condition that flares up sometimes. It's mostly in remission, but um, it's been worse in years past, a chronic condition of social retardation. So I have a hard time hanging out at the, at the park trying to talk to anybody. But now with the camera in my hand, it makes it, you know, I'm there for a reason and I'm you know, shooting stuff from media and, and I'm all into trying to film some of the camp life stuff and I'm going to camp meetings in the day and, and there's the characters, there's a guy named Radio with the crazy dreadlocks and wild beard and, and he's 50 years old. The way I know he's 50 years old is because any time that we had an opportunity for people to speak to the assembly, he would sometimes stumble to the front and say, I'm 50 years old. I've lived over there, I've lived over there, I've lived... I also know that someone threw an apple at his tent because after saying he's 50 years old, he would say, you know, the first night somebody threw an apple at my tent. And normally I ought to handle that with this, but I'm trying to be a different man. And, and the facilitation team would try and like smooth him off the stage. And, and, and if they'd have different strategies, like sometimes he'd, get, he'd pause or get to what seemed like the end of a thought or a sentence and they would applaud. And you go, ah, and then walk away. And, and that worked the first three times until they all applauded. And he went, ah, and then kept talking. So, And I'm there, and I'm fascinated with all these things. I'm trying to cut my video. We had um, Occupy Wall Street, their first little solidarity tour. And, and Justin and Preach and George and Malik came to town. And, and we got to meet them. And afterwards, we had a little meeting with them. And these guys are just inspiring the hell out of me. And they seem so sure of the possibility of this revolution. And they've got strategy this and, and opportunity that. And I'm thinking, yeah. And one guy in our group from Occupy Detroit was giving these amazingly insightful media strategies and, and a way to boil down issues into kind of bite-sized nuggets. And I'm, I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, yeah, this guy's sharp. Then he throws away as kind of an aside, I've been homeless off and on for the last 15 years. And I, first time that that division of homeless, not homeless kind of fell apart a little bit because there is, at least for me, some of that us them. That sometimes someone that's homeless almost feels like a different creature. And now that's, this is some guy that knows way about, more about issues than I do. This is a guy that I've been standing side by side with, maybe marching with, sharing meals with. And that all kind of fell apart. And it also occurred to me that, look, I couldn't make my mortgage payment. I'm an only child of a dad who retired from Ford Motor Company. I'm never going to be homeless, right? I'm, I'm his path to my dad's only grandparents, so I'm never going to live in the street. Dad's always going to help me out. But I thought, what if I don't have him? And my wife, when we didn't have health insurance, 
had these blinding headaches, goes to the hospital, they keep her there three hours, offer no diagnosis, it just cluster headaches, that they gave her some Tylenol, three hours, no diagnosis, no treatment, $6,000 were on the hook for that. And I realized it wouldn't take very many hits for someone to go from being us to them. And so now I'm trying to think about that and connect with everyone. And I go down, I finally get permission to camp myself. I say get permission because I've been married 12 years. <laughs> One of the ways that I've been married 12 years, I know when to get permission. So I ask permission to go down and encamp in the park. I set up my camp early on a Sunday. It's during a Lions game, Detroit Lions game. And every the Lions fans have to come past our park. So on the Pingree statue on the corner, a former mayor of Detroit, governor of Michigan, it's a statue with a few levels you can sit on and sit around. And we're down there, and we've got some visibility, and we're handing out water to people. And I've lived 41 years of my life without ever having anyone yell at me, get a job. And now as I stand on that corner, I'm hearing it like, like every hour, people driving by, rolling down their window just to say, get a job. And we're there on the corner, but now it's not just drive-bys. We've got the Lions fans walking by, and they, man, this one big beefy guy is so furious with us, and he's there arguing with everybody on this statue, and socialism that, and hand out this, and you know, destroying our country that. And we have this woman up on the top, one of our younger occupiers, like 17, 18, she's up there, and this guy reaches in his pocket, takes change, starts throwing at her legs, going, here, you want a handout? That's all you people want? Here, take. And there the guys around like, hey, 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 and he's there arguing. This older woman that is sitting at the corner of the statue painfully eases her way off the statue, walks around, <clears throat> picks off up one of the quarters that had rolled off the statue, walks all the way around to this lion's fan while he's in the middle of his tirade, grabs his wrist, takes his hand, puts the quarter in his hand, and walks away. He didn't catch it, because he was so trapped in ego and anger. But I'm watching from the sideline going, oh my god, that was the most amazing, spiritual, metaphysical bitch slap I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> she destroyed this guy, and he didn't even know it. <laughs> that night, I'm serving pizza in the, in the food tent, which we've kind of, and this was a tough moment for, for our movement because we kind of shut down the kitchen, partly because we had a bad rats issue, but partly because the occupiers that were working the kitchen were busting their ass 16 hours a day feeding people. And it was like running a soup kitchen. And they would serve homeless people all day long and then the occupiers wouldn't get to eat some of the time. And so we kind of figured out how do we restructure, what do we do when we close the, the kitchen off a little bit. And I see one of the neighborhood guys, one of the homeless guys, and he comes in, I give him a slice of pizza, and then he, got, then he comes back around for a second slice. And our head of security, uh, one of a few people that were kind of identified as the point people on security, a guy named Frank, he um, sees the guy there and tells him to leave. All of a sudden, this guy's face changes like he had put a mask on, and it's hatred and anger. And he starts yelling at our security guy going, I'm not going to act like I don't know you. For four dollars, you cut my throat. Over four fucking dollars, you slit my throat. Two other security people kind of move this guy out a little bit. And he's like, y'all don't even know you got a wolf in sheep's clothing here. One thing I noticed about that interaction is that our security point person never argues any of the facts of the case, never says, no, I didn't slit your throat over four dollars. <laughs> Which made me wonder if we've picked either the possible <laughs> best or worst head of security we could. <laughs> But I'm kind of weirded out a little bit. This guy is we're moving him outside of the camp area. The way that Grand Circus Park is, there's this dead fountain in the middle, and then it's very Detroit Park, so there's more cement than grass. And there's cement on the outside, then there's benches, and then around that is where the grass is at that people were camping at. So now I have this, this guy's out here in this, and at nighttime in the camp, it was this weird lighting. It's this kind of harsh, whitish yellow light that is angled in such a way that from when it's reflecting off the cement, when you leave the cement for the grassy area, it's like you go from light into darkness like that. I'm there trying to talk to this guy. Part of how I was able to serve sometimes is I could kind of talk people down off ledges a little bit. Maybe it goes back to the <laughs> reverend days. Um, and I would say like a mantra, be a calming influence, a peaceful presence. And 
So like our point person on media, she was all discouraged and was going to quit the movement because her, her camera had just been stolen. And she's all, you don't understand. For, I'm a photojournalist. For me to lose my camera, that's like, that's like an Olympic cyclist losing his legs. And I asked, well, isn't it more like an Olympic cyclist losing his bike? <laughs> and she laughed and kind of calmed down a little bit and didn't quit then. But so that's how I'm trying to serve. So I'm trying to talk this guy down. But I'm sitting next to this middle-aged black woman next to me on the benches. And I thought I had some chill. Oh, my God. This woman was like a vortex of peacefulness. You would, you would have stress in your life and walk past her, and it would get sucked out of you into her and then disappear into the universe. It was amazing. She talks this guy down with the cutthroat thing, and he's all smooth, and, and other people are walking around, and she calls herself Auntie, and I swear it was the Oracle from the Matrix. I swear it was. <laughs> she was even handing out candy instead of cookies. It was fantastic. And she's there, and she's showing people out, and I'm watching her, and this guy's cool, and everybody's cool. And then when Auntie starts to, you know, calm people down, this older woman comes walking across. I don't even recognize her at first, but it's the quarter woman for earlier, and she has this pained look on her face, and I'm like, honey, are you okay? I have cancer, and walks into the darkness and disappears. And then it's Auntie's time to go home, and she stands up, and the way she says goodnight to people is she hugs them and speaks in tongues and touches their face. And then walks into the darkness and disappears. Ah, this place is freaking me out. I gotta go to my tent. <laughs> so I do. I go to my tent, and I'm thinking the Lions fans from earlier, and then and this woman and all this craziness and cutthroat guy and I'm there trying to figure it out. I drift to sleep. The next day I wake up and I go down to have some coffee at 1515 Broadway. I hear jazz music playing behind the back wall. But I realize it's not a wall, it's a curtain. And I push the curtain aside and I peek back and I see this gorgeous 100 seat black box theater. And I think, I do theater. <laughs> so I go to the barista and I asked her, what's the deal with this theater? Oh yeah, you know, we have lots of shows here, some theater companies do their seasons here, we use it as an arts incubator, and we just had a show canceled, you should talk to the owner. So I talk to the owner, he has me bring a press kit down, I show him my stuff, he says, what's the quickest you can get the show up? I've done it a hundred times, I can do it tomorrow, but I say two weeks, I figure I can promote it in two weeks. So two and a half weeks from tonight is day before Thanksgiving, the busiest bar night of the year. Most people don't know, more people go out then than on New Year's Eve. And we had this company canceled, they're coming back in spring, you want the night? Yeah, and he tells me the deal of the theater and says it's one price to rent one, to do one show, it's a cheaper price if you do back, you know, second show back to back, and I asked, well, what do you think? And he goes, well, I always say, aim low and obliterate your target. <laughs> I'll do one. <laughs> so I signed the contract for one show, I find out that if it's any type of a fundraiser, you can have an afterglow afterwards and give out food and alcohol. So I give back 20% of the tickets to Occupy and the Burners Without Borders, and, and um, I'm all excited about it because I'm thinking even if I don't sell tickets, I'm three blocks away from the encampment. I'll walk my little ass down there and go, I have free food and booze, come see my show. I know I can fill up that damn theater, right? <laughs> So I get a progressive radio show that promos my show. I get a little newspaper article. I'm thinking everything's sweet. One week before my hometown debut, I get a couple of calls. One from my friend John Grady, a storyteller like me, who's now going to play at the Moth main stage. And he invites me down with my VIP comp ticket. So I'm all excited about that. And then I get another call from a guy in London, Ontario, who's going to drive down and see my show. It's part of why he was calling me. The other part was to talk about Camp Thompson Brad. Probably not what his mom named him. I think it was a nickname he gathered later in life. But <laughs> Camp Counselor Brad was a friend I met doing my Preacher Man show, which the second half was about Burning Man. He's kind of one of the head burners up in London, Ontario, and he runs a theme camp, and he's real well known in the whole Canadian burner community. He has a barbecue, invites us over. I'm talking to him, and I am just spilling secrets with him. That's why he's called Camp Counselor, is because you meet this guy, and you feel so at ease that you just trust him and want to share. And he's telling me about his theme camp, and he's also telling me about one of the contests at his theme camp that he's well known for. Um, it's called the Great Canadian Beaver Eating Contest. <laughs> When I first heard the title, I thought, well, it can't be that. Right? <laughs> no, it's freaking that. 
He shows me this postcard that has all the rules of the contest. He tells me about the one couple who's not allowed to compete anymore because they won it three years in a row. And I'm thinking, well, good for him or good for her, as the case may be. And I'm like, okay. And I'm telling him, Preacher Man is my happy, happy little How My Family Saved My Life story. Right before I was to take it on a multi-city tour for the first time on my way practically out of town, my wife tells me that she doesn't think she wants to be married to me anymore. Well, honey, that's kind of fucking up the narrative of my show. Um, but I go to London, and I'm looking around, and it was like my opportunity to run away with the circus. Because I'm thinking, if this marriage splits off, I can go city to city on the French festival tour, 10 days at a time, getting attention from people. All right, women, I'm um, getting attention. From, and, and I could be quasi-celebrity in this little world. And, and hell, I could be the fun dad coming back with awesome souvenirs. And it's not even my fault because I didn't end the marriage. I mean, sure, she was ending it because of my bullshit. But still, I wasn't the one that actually pulled the trigger. And I'm there, and I'm telling this guy with this, you know, contest. And then my, and he goes, well, do you mind if I offer you a little advice? And I think, sure. He says, well, I look back at my first marriage, and I wish I would have worked harder to say it. I would suggest, take it if it fits, that you do whatever you need to do so that you would never look back and think, I could have done more to keep my family together. And I'm thinking, no, no, this is not the advice from the guy who runs the pussy eating contest in the desert. <laughs> You're supposed to tell me to go eat some, anyway. So. <laughs> But as soon as it hits my ears and my brain and my heart, I know it's right. And I go home and I work my ass off. And four and a half years later, she hasn't left me yet. Wow. And this guy became that guy in my life. I don't have brothers. Um, my dad and I aren't super close. He was my mentor. Every time I had business issues or relationship issues or artistic issues, I would go and share with this guy. And he wasn't just camp counselor on a personal basis. His gig was kind of based on the same gift, right? He was. A, a, he does really well in business. He's a corporate consultant. His biggest client is Hewlett Packard. And that's part of, I think, the misunderstanding of Occupy is I don't have anything against people making good money. I, I want to sell out the Fox, for God's sake. That's going to be a good payday if that ever happened. But I don't want you to be able to use your money to control the political system that runs my life. That's all. That's not that hard. Even with the guy fighting on the statue, I'm thinking, to try and start a conversation. Now I've gotten a little bit more skilled at it, but at the time I'm thinking, all right, let's do this. Let me ask you this. Do you think that our government is too corrupt, just the right amount corrupt, <laughs> not quite corrupt enough? Do you think that Wall Street, the big banks, and other financial interests have too much influence over our political system? just the right amount of influence over our political system or not quite enough. So I'm not trying to tell anyone they can't earn money. And this guy, Brad, was earning plenty of money by eliciting people, telling them their problems, and finding a quick solution. And that's who this guy was to me. Rich had called me to tell me that Brad went to a Burning Man event in Toronto, went back home, went to sleep, and never woke up again. 48 years old, died of a heart attack, left three kids under the age of five. Obviously, my loss nothing compared to theirs, but man, he was my dude. And it was enough to leave me weeping in my car on Elizabeth Street in downtown Detroit. But after the car, I went to saw John's show and saw they had sold 1,500 tickets to people telling the stories. I'm a week away from the hometown debut. Two days after that night, I'm invited to speak at Brad's funeral, the biggest honor of my life, maybe. And I share what I've show, told with you tonight, well, except the contest. That didn't seem appropriate to talk about that. <laughs> I also talked about the last time I saw him. He had let me use his RV to encamp myself while I was at this theater festival. And I rode my bike back and forth to the venue. He's packing up the camper the last day, and he looks at the sky, and he says, look, and he calls it something. I won't remember what he calls it, but he shows me across the horizon that every place that, for instance, there's a tall tree, that if you look in the clouds above it, there's a tree-shaped hole cut out. And where the clouds are low and thick, there's like no landscape underneath. And I look back, and across the horizon, it looked like the planet had been pulled apart like a jigsaw. I'm freaking out. Wow. He's like, oh, you've never seen that? Dude, come on. 
I realized that Brad was a picture of someone fitting their gift in life so perfectly. That ability to make people trust him and want to share and to have the wisdom to offer a little phrase, a little sentence that you go, oh yeah, I can't believe I didn't think of it. And maybe he fit his gift so perfectly because he had such a short time to give it to the rest of us. And I tried to take that lesson back home with me to make sure that I fit my gift, that maybe I can help other people fit their gift. And I wanted to take that lesson to Occupy, but as I rolled back into the camp after that weekend, Occupy was gone. At least the encampment was gone. We have known for a while it was kind of on its way. They went around hammering in signs that say park closes at 10 p.m., even though that had always technically been the rule. When they put the signs in, we knew we were on our way out. For the Thanksgiving Day Parade, they didn't want us anywhere near the nationally televised Thanksgiving Day Parade. So we knew we were on our way out, and there's discussion, do we fight and keep the tent, the encampment? And, and then we watched what is still one of the most disgusting moments in the Occupy phenomenon was when the mayor of Oakland let it slip that 12 mayors had a conference call and planned to stop out all the encampments on the same day so no one city would have to take the heat. And to think that on a national basis that, that elected officials would strategize on how to stomp out the right to assemble, the right of free speech, and here in New York, the right of free press because Bloomberg pushed back the press blocks and instituted a no-fly zone over the encampment. I mean, I know y'all were bigger than us in Detroit, but man, I didn't know you had your own Air Force. That's fantastic. <laughs> Why? Because they don't want video footage of people getting their heads kicked in. And we're wondering, do we get them? thinking, look, if, if they couldn't hold Zuccotti, we're not holding Grand Circus. And one of our old union guys was like in the strikes of the, the newspaper strikes in the early 90s, and he says, they went through us like a knife through hot butter, and said, they destroyed us in two minutes. Said, they beat our fucking heads in. The camp, we let go. I asked Chris about it at 1515 Broadway, the old the Marine combat veteran from back in the day, and he says, eh. Declare victory and go home. Winner's coming anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. So that's kind of what we did, right? <laughs> but then there became this shift because now the energy that was peddling, because that camp for a lot of times, and I'm still a media observer. I was only part-time down there a couple nights a week. But all the energy was about survival, keeping that thing going. And now that's gone. And we have space in another location. And people, some people wanted to go to that space. Some didn't. And um, then we had a splinter group break off and go to that space. And, and they, they, just, they call themselves Unite Detroit, which a splinter group being named Unite Detroit is fantastic. <laughs> so there's all this. But then there's this Occupy Our Homes national campaign that we tap into on a local basis about fighting eviction defenses and foreclosures. And the Henry family is one of our first cases we take on, a woman that had a stroke and lost her job. Bank of America gave them a temporary refi. They paid payments on that temporary refi for eight months until they sent the ninth month back to them and said, never mind, we're going to foreclose on you anyway. It happens over and over again. So we, a little five-people team, have the strategies all mapped out. They have a phone bank run out of the Henry family's basement where they're calling Bank of America all, all day long, saying let the Henrys keep their home. We have a press conference on their front lawn. We march uh, a local 600 UAW union, United Auto Workers, sends like 100 people. We get press coverage. Bank of America calls them and says, fine, fine. Let's make a deal. And they rewrote their mortgage and they're still in their home. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> the Garrett family's next. A guy blind from diabetes lives with his adult daughter. The, his whole home has been sold out for, under him for $12,000. The bank buys it back. He gathers up $12,000 from friends and families and fundraisers. The bank won't talk to him because they can make more off the defaulted mortgage, the insurance that covers it, and the fees that they've already collected. If they redo it again, then they can collect like three times on the same property. But same thing, the dumpster is to be dumped in their driveway, but they can't set the dumpster down because the driveway is covered with occupiers. Wells Fargo doesn't want any part of that coverage, they call, and the Garrett family is in their home today. I am all on board. I am so fired up about occupier homes. I'm thinking that's a way I can serve in the immediate, so I'm all about it. But now I've got to worry about my hometown debut because my guaranteed audience has just been ripped out of the park. So I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> So I'm still getting the word going. I go down there. I'm there an hour before. I meet my tech 
who's going to run the lights and sounds. And remember what Chris looks like, you know, with the teeth and the hair and the body, and, and then his tech that runs house and lights, this guy named Theo, who's got the one blind eye well, chopped off to the side. And I'm like, my crew is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> A half hour before the show, there's nobody in the building. My first ticket buyer comes in about 25 minutes before the show. I go walking outside to catch my breath a little bit, and I see three occupiers walking the wrong direction. I'm like, you freaking stoners, get back over here! <laughs> They're like, oh, we'll be there, and they keep walking. I go, I go back in, I hear someone go, Tom, no one's called me Tom since I changed my name from Tom to Tommy when I moved to Las Vegas, because it sounded more Vegas-y. Um, so I hear Tom, I spin around, it's Leah Jenkins and her little sister. I had a crush on Leah in high school. And if we're talking me and high school, that means it is by definition an unrequited crush. <laughs> and I'm so excited that she's there until I remember that I have like two or three people in the audience. And I'm like, oh God, I'm still the same failed break dancer from eighth grade. <laughs> so now I go in and there's a couple more people straggle in. I go through the back of the theater and I know when the door shuts behind me that I won't be able to get back in that door. But I'm just going to walk through the alley and come back around the front of the theater. The door shuts. I look to where I'm going to walk down the alley, and I see it's all fenced in with barbed wire fence. Ah, oh, shit. And then I look down, and I see I, whatever number I say, I'm going to think I'm either exaggerating or undershooting it. But there was a lot, because there are three restaurants next to the theater, and their dumpsters are in the back. And there are these giant Detroit City alley rats, like, having a party back there. And I'm like, ah, oh, God. And then I look this way, and there's less rats, because there's big puddles of water. And I'm thinking, all right, I can, there's a packing crate in one of the puddles. And if I can jump to the packing crate, then I can jump to this fence. Because this end of the alley is also fenced in. I am trapped in this alley with no cell phone, five minutes to curtain before my big hometown debut that has three people in the audience. So I go and I jump to this packing crate, and as I do that, I make noise, and these two giant rats run underneath it to hide. I'm like, ah, geez. And I grab the fence, and I climb halfway up. The second half of the fence is all wobbly, and it's like, wah, and I can't get over it because it's bent back so far. <laughs> And I get to the post next to it, and I grab the post, and I inch my way up, and I find a spot between the barbed wire, and I throw my leg over, but it's all wobbling now. And then I start to pull this leg over, and I can't move because I feel that my jeans has hooked onto the barbed wire on top of the fence. And I can't undo it, so I just have to force it and throw my leg over, and I drop to the ground to feel how much of my underwear is showing through the back of my ripped jeans, and it was a lot. <laughs> This is a fantastic hometown debut. <laughs> I go into the theater now, which is still, it's, it's closer. There's, it's not a full house at all. There's like a dozen people in there. I go backstage and my intro music, we hold curtain until it's a 20 minutes past curtain. My intro music goes up. I walk on the stage. I pour out a shot for my friend Brad. I can't see the audience because of the stage lights, but I get that applause walking to the stage and it felt full. 